testimony. Uh, Ms. Axmith, um, I guess you raised a, a very interesting question here about this um, uh, mediation uh, certificate. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, sir. And um, <clears throat> could, I guess, when one could explore in order to have standing or in order for the court to have jurisdiction to even hear the matter that they, that the parties must have gone through this process, would that also be an option? Um, you mean within the, court, the context of litigation, if a suit yeah. like this is brought, yeah. that the motion to dismiss includes um, saying that they don't have standing the because failure, yes, certainly um, that can be part of it. But what I'm saying is the courts are letting them go forward. Yeah, but and what I'm saying, like, this would be a condition proceeding. So if you don't have the, 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 uh, oh, I agree, the, the I agree. certificate, then you can't even, the court doesn't even have jurisdiction to I, even hear the matter. I agree that that clarity needs to be brought to all levels of district and government, including the courts, because it's not there now. Now, the, the, government, the government's position that they state the department does not necessarily view a lender's decision to choose judicial foreclosure as a circumvention of the law because the judicial process has the checks and balances that were previously missing from the non-judicial process. In addition, Disby's Office of General Counsel has counseled that the presence of the judicial process is likely essential to preserving the mediation program from being an unconstitutional constraint on a con Tack. What do you say to that? I'm really glad that that was mentioned because I really don't know of any jurisdiction that has simultaneous laws, judicial and non-judicial foreclosure. But let's address the, the first part of what you said. The judicial process, that's why in my... Of, of what Disby said. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, the judicial process, that's full-scale litigation. It costs twenty to forty thousand dollars, and people can't afford that. That's the problem, and the mortgage companies know that. Most people can't afford that, let alone people who have dealt with issues of um, foreclosure. And so the the amount of money that it takes to demonstrate that these are faulty foreclosure certificates requiring the courts are not requiring people to, I mean, not requiring the mortgage companies to show up with the original note. They're, they're not requiring these things. And they're, I have seen robo-signed documents just accepted by the courts. So this, if, if, if we have a standard, and if we have a standard in this jurisdiction for documents, for people to be foreclosed on, it shouldn't vary depending on who's got more money. And right now, we've got different standards, and it does depend on who's got more money. The mortgage banks and the banks have more money so they can bring a civil suit, and they're banking that the homeowner doesn't have as much money as they have, and therefore they're not going to be able to launch the kind of discovery that will be required to prove that these documents are either false or that they don't own the note or that there's no standing. That's what the essential problem is. I don't disagree that uh, I don't oppose judicial foreclosure jurisdictions. I practice in Pennsylvania. Um, but their constitutional concerns, it works in Philadelphia, the entire city of Philadelphia. You cannot have a foreclosure without a mediation certificate signed. So, Do you practice in the District of Columbia as well? Oh, yes, okay. mostly in the District of Columbia, but also in Philadelphia. So I have some basis of comparison. So that would be my response, is if the purpose is to protect homeowners, then this really isn't too much to ask. And if you, we went to the effort of passing very good laws and very good regulations, it should be applied uniformly. So if we solve problem number one, does that solve your problem number two? 